get started here. Um, we have, looks like we've got everybody here so far. Um, I want to welcome you all into another edition of the Big Texas Read. We're so glad that you're here. And we are discussing tonight Kathleen Kent's great follow up to the dime. We're talking about the burn. Um, my name is Blake Kimsey. You've probably gotten an email from me, um, the Executive Director of Writing Workshops Dallas, who is putting this on along with Jim and I, Inc. Um, Alexandra's not here, but our third co-founder, David Samuel Levinson, is. And so we all just want to thank you. Um, we've also just kind of gotten um, some sponsorship from the University of Texas at San Antonio Library System, who's been kind of spreading the word about the Big Texas Read. Um, and we're very thankful to them, as well as Lone Star Literary. So if you don't follow Lone Star Literary on um, the internet, on the interweb, you should, <laughs> because uh, they do all things bookish. So if you're looking for more great events around the state, Lone Star Literary is where you should look, because they've got a great schedule. So um, I want to introduce um, Heather Harper Ellett very quickly, um, who is going to be our guest moderator tonight. Um, Heather is the author of Ain't Nobody, Nobody, which was named a Best Debut by Library Journal and a Best Work of First Fiction finalist by the Texas Institute of Letters. And I want to read something that um, Kathleen said about Ain't Nobody, Nobody. She said, Kathleen says of, of uh, Heather's debut, the dark poetry of East Texas has found a new lyrical voice in Heather Harper Ellett's debut book, Ain't Nobody, Nobody where the landscape is as feral and potentially deadly as the predators that inhabit it, and where love and loyalty can prove as dangerous as greed and betrayal. That is from Kathleen Kent, our Edgar-nominated author of The Dime. And you all know Kathleen Kent um, from The Dime as well as The Burn, and she's also the New York Times bestselling author of The Heretic's Daughter, The Traitor's Wife, and The Outcasts. So thank you for being here to both of you. And I figure we'll start off with a reading from Kathleen and then we'll let Heather take it from there. Thank you, Blake and David and Heather and welcome all of you to uh, tonight's Q&A. We're gonna be talking about The Burn, which is the second book in the Detective Betty Rizik series. Um, just to set up, I'm just gonna read a very short a couple of pages from the burn and just to set it up, um, at the end of the dime, <clears throat> uh, Detective Betty has been really brutalized physically. And what I explore in the burn is her PTSD following her uh, kidnapping with the Roy family and how she has to deal with that. And at the beginning of the burn, Betty's not doing very well. She's, um, she's really stressed and um, having difficulties. And she very quickly runs afoul of the new sergeant at her station um, who puts her on desk duty and it, uh, insists that before she can come back to full active duty, she has to go into therapy, which for many cops is a fate worse than death. So um, what I'm going to be reading is that she's, um, she is back to work, she's struggling, and she's meeting with, um, she's meeting with her, um, her partner, Jackie, her wife's great uncle, uh, James Earl, who was a Vietnam vet. And he's kind of a pole star for her, just like her uncle Benny is, except James Earl is very much alive, whereas Benny is, speaks to her from the great beyond. So this is just a couple of pages from chapter 10, and it's January 8th, 2014, Norma's Cafe. Thanks for coming over last night, I say to James after the waitress has taken our order and walked away. He nods, pouring a torrent of sugar into his coffee. That's what family's for. He holds his cup up in both hands while he takes a sip his red-veined eyes over the rim steadily holding my gaze. Still having nightmares, he asks. Sometimes, I say, but I've said it too quickly, too flippantly, and he smiles sadly, carefully setting the cup down on the table. He runs a hand through his hair, held off his forehead by an overabundance of hair gel. You know, he said, it took me a long time a long while to get rid of the worst of the creepy crawlies after I got back from Nam. 
And I was a whole lot better off than some who spent more time in country than I did. Now they call it PTSD. Back in the day, we just called it PAP, prolonged adjustment period. Night terrors, shortened attention span, and even shorter fuse. My wife took the brunt of it. I was told by my doctor to buck up, take it like a man. So I did. Started drinking like one too. Lost my wife, my job, just about everything. I was angry all the time. It took me 20 years to figure out it was because I was so damn scared all the time. And I was just an MP. I fired my service pistol exactly twice, and those were just warning shots. The waitress returns to our booth with a plate of chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes drowning in white gravy for me and a hamburger for James. She stands next to the table, eagle-eyed, absent-mindedly probing her mile-high lacquered hair with a pencil me until I pick up a fork and start eating. God loves a good eater, she says before walking away. I take out Dr. Theodosu's appointment card and pass it to James. I'm seeing him tonight. That's good, he says encouragingly. Yeah, well, it's the only way I'm going to get back into full engagement. I've been put on desk duty. According to my sergeant, I have some anger issues. I smirk and put air quotes around the phrase. Do you think you've got anger issues? James asks, passing the card back to me. I take a bite of the steak, but it's already losing heat, the gravy morphing into wet cement. Pushing the plate away, I say, I'm frustrated, James. I need to get back to work, but I'm being blocked at every turn by a boss who's got a bug up his ass about me. I can't run, I can't sleep at night, and I can't do my job sitting at a desk all day. What I don't say out loud is I'm also imagining that I see Evangeline Roy everywhere I turn. James takes another sip of oversugared coffee. He hasn't yet touched his hamburger. That would be enough to piss me off, he says quietly. Everyone tiptoes around me like I'm made of glass. Maybe they're afraid of you. I shake my head. The people I work with should know I'm all bark and no bite. I wasn't talking about the people you work with. I realize he's talking about Jackie now. My face turns red in recognition of the truth, and it makes me angry. I divert my gaze to a sign above the counter. Life is short, start with dessert. I suddenly want pie or a brownie or a piece of cake, anything sweet to take the bitter taste out of my mouth. I'm searching for the waitress so I can engage her in whatever inane conversation will move the topic away from me and my anger issues. James Earl is saying something, but I'm concentrating on the glass confectionery case next to the, gla the cash register. He taps me on the arm until I look at him and he says, Betty, you killed someone. Two people, in fact. Not from a distance, but up close and personal. And this after you witnessed a partner murdered not three feet away. That changes a person, poisons them if you let it. Jackie's worried about you. I'm worried about you. Stuck in the abyss of my own morass, I mutter. To James's questioning gaze, I say, just something Uncle Benny used to say to me. Look, I know that I need to tone down the drinking, stop raging around the house. I'll step up my workout routine, start a yoga class or Tai Chi or something to release my inner Zen self. I know I've been a bear to live with and I'm sorry that Jackie's taking the lion's share of it. My work phone in my right pocket buzzes and I answer it. Riz, Seth's voice in my ear says, tension thickening his voice. We found another ex-drug dealer. Dead, I asked a little too loudly, and James looks up quickly, brow furrowed. As a doornail, says Seth. And it only gets worse for Betty from that point on. <laughs> but it's so delicious. We all get to benefit from that. Oh. So I'm so glad that you started with that scene specifically because I'm, in addition to being a novelist, I'm a therapist in practice. And so I'm really interested in the PTSD element of this story because I felt like you did such a great job um, capturing kind of the hell of PTSD and that you can't trust your own instincts anymore, which is especially devastating for someone 
who, for whom instincts are a life or death matter. And so, I mean, at one point she pulls a gun on a midwife visiting the house and she <laughs> sees the image of her captor kind of everywhere she turns. And so yeah. tell me more about uh, how you researched PTSD and how you went into, how you approached trauma. Um, well, I, I talked to a lot of ex-cops mm -hmm. who talked about uh, the stress on the job. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think this is really timely because we're in conversation right now about the police, their um, excessive use of force, the intrinsic violence within certain police forces. And... When I started digging into this a little more deeply, you know, I found that a lot of the um, a lot of the fear, the paranoia that police have, as well as active duty. I mean, the police force is a paramilitary force. It's a hierarchy. They they put they do put their life on the line, and I don't want to diminish the fact that that it is a dangerous job. However, statistically, the Department of Labor. Um, has listed the most dangerous jobs and a police officer is number 16. Oh. The top 10 are logging workers, fishers, pilots, roofers, refuse workers. I mean, there's a whole list of top 10 most dangerous jobs statistically and police aren't even on that list. Um, but, there is a, but there is an internal culture within the police force that, that draws a line, the thin blue line and says, we're here, the cops are here and everybody else is over there. So I think first of all, that, that uh, perception of being us and them as opposed to we, you know, a collective we fosters this kind of paranoia. And uh, there's a long history of secrecy in the police department. You know, you support your fellow cop no matter what. Um, it's primarily male. Uh, and I think it attracts a lot of primarily men. I mean, still t statistically, 80% of police forces across the board are still male. Actually, um, Dallas, the Dallas Police Department, in terms of gender, is a slightly bit better than the New York, let's say NYPD. Wow. But it's still primarily men. It attracts a lot of men who um, are, are perhaps um, reticent about getting in touch with their tender side. You know, it's, it's a culture of dominance. It's, it's a culture of playing with weapons. You know, I mean, it's a deadly game. Um, ironically, the two most dangerous times for a cop are traffic stops and domestic disputes. Um, that's when we see a lot of fatalities. So there is a lot of, of paranoia that, that uh, they're gonna be expected to use a gun, that, they're gonna be ex that there's an expectation that, they, that to be effective as police, they have to use force. And um, also, I think within the culture, it, it fosters the idea of, you know, you suck it up, you be a man, you just follow orders, and then you drink yourself into a stupor to get rid of those, those um, uncomfortable feelings. And with Betty, you know, Betty grew up in a household of cops, her brother, her father, her uncle, I mean, long line of police. And um, she's been kind of brought up in that culture and she's a force of nature. She's very strong willed. She's not kind of a, there's a tender side to her, but she's not a touchy feely person. And it really is anathema, not only within the military still, but within the police force to seek uh, psychiatric help. There's, there's an element of shame involved. So when you are involved in these very tense situations um, with an, and have experienced violence or you dish out violence, there's a psychic cost to that. And unfortunately, without a healthy release, um, you suffer. And I think I've, ta I've talked to police, retired police, who um, a lot of them didn't deal with 
the psychic damage that was done until they retired because it would have been seen as a sign of weakness. And so um, that, that kind of fascinated me and I wanted to explore that with Betty and I wanted to show her that, that she was in fact helped and given comfort through, through the therapy process. Um, so that was, that was kind of a challenge because I think that's a very important part of, of policing as, it's, as it is now, that, there is, that there's a horrible psychic cost to being, uh, to having an expectation of using brute force to solve society's ills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you explore that so nicely. And it, there are a lot of thinking points on that because she's constantly having to, um, you know, navigate, is this a good cop? Is this a bad cop? And where her line is. Yeah. And just being in her head for that is really, um, it's a wild ride because you, as the reader, can't really, you can't quite tell either. And so it really keeps you turning the pages to try to orient yourself. But I love that you're speaking about the psychological toll of violence because I'm going to go with that in a slightly different different way. Um, so yeah, the end of the dime was incredibly violent and there, you know, you don't shy away from that in this book either. And, you know, I, I kind of giggled in that good way when I saw that Maureen Corrigan of NPR described the dime is one of the most violent suspense plots I've read in a long time. And I bet you are thrilled, like that's a compliment for what you're doing there. Uh, but I was really curious because as actors kind of can become method actors to really embody a character. I think writers can do that too and are really affected by the things that they write. So how do you approach writing violence? Um, because you really have to get in there and experience with, with the characters and how do you put it aside? Um, well, that, that's a good question because, you know, the history of the world is violent. Yeah. Um, the, the, form, the formulation of this country was built on violence. And you can't, um, you can't write about history without, without expressing violence. And so starting out writing three works of historical fiction, the first book was about the Salem witch trials and about the violence perpetrated on primarily women who were seen as you know, uh, outcasts or mar marginalized. So there, there was violence there. There was violence in the second book, uh, The Traitor's Wife, because I go into the English Civil War. And that was, I mean, the roots of our American revolution took, took root in the English Civil War. Um, it was incredibly violent, went on for years, ended up having King Charles I beheaded. Um, and I didn't shy away from that because I don't think you can paint a picture in, in, in its entirety without exploring the idea um, of violence and the consequences of violence, especially for women. Mm -hmm. And so in The Outcasts, one of the main protagonists um, was a, a Lucinda Carter was a prostitute and um, she's thrust into some very violent situations. Um, and, and with that, I had a male protagonist and a female protagonist, and I kind of wanted to explore how violence affected men and women differently. Um, you know, men go off to fight the battle and the women are left to mourn the dead and pick up the pieces and go on, you know. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. So moving into contemporary crime, I, I, I was already familiar with writing about violence. Um, and it's not, when I say I was comfortable with it, I don't mean I'm okay with violence. Mm -hmm. I just mean that, that if you're going to paint a picture, um, I guess one of, the, one of the strangest compliments I got from a reviewer, uh, and I think it was from Texas Monthly about the outcast, was that he said she writes like a man because she doesn't shy away from violence. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of absurd when you think that, you know, women have always been, you know, if not actively engaged in the battle, they see the results of it. They're there to bury the dead, to clean up, you know, to pick up the pieces. And so, um, you know, I think it's part of the human condition, male or female, to have to deal with violence when you're dealing with law enforcement, especially undercover. Um, so I have a, a cousin and I spoke about him uh, briefly last time. He's um, just retired 32 years on the force. He worked narcotics undercover. He worked vice undercover. He was the youngest officer in charge on the SWAT team 
in Plano. Um, I mean, just an incredible uh, resource for this. And there are so many gray areas. You know, part of the burnout rate for undercover cops is, is very, very high because of the gray areas. You know, if you have a black and white, this is right, this is wrong. This is the rule you follow, this is what you stay away from. There's less psychic drag because of that, because it's very clear when you're dealing with undercover um, detectives, and I, and I spoke to several through, through my cousin. He introduced me to several. Several of them were still active duty. Um, and so they talk about this, 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 the stress of, of dealing undercover and um, a lot of the times, the, the expectation of violence, you know, that tension has to go somewhere. And so it turns inward and they end up doing, you know, you hear about undercover cops getting addicted to drugs. They drink too much. I mean, most of the undercover cops that I met, uh, you know, do all of that stuff to, to narcotize their feelings. Because you work, it, it, because it's very difficult to work in the gray area, you know. Um, they're asked to do things. If you're working vice and you, you know, you're trying to bust sex trafficking rings, you've got to go where the sex, where the pedophiles are. I mean, and, and that sort of thing um, has lasting consequences to, you know, it, unless you're a psychopath, it's, it's going to have very damaging consequences. Yeah, we did a really lovely job exploring that, and especially uh, her partner, Seth. Um, is dealing with his own addiction. And so it was, um, you know, it was painful to watch, watch her be in pain for him and fig trying to figure out how to, how to navigate it. Right. Um, so in a slightly different direction, some of my favorite moments in The Burn were kind of the ensemble cast of the female characters because mm. they, they really circle around Betty's home that she shares with her wife, Jackie. And it kind of becomes a halfway house, um, an unlikely halfway house. And she has um, a pregnant teenager living with her. And then suddenly there's a trans woman from the street living with her. And she wakes up to her vacuuming her house in high heels, which I just love the image of that. And so it becomes very homey as a part of her recovery. And um, I also loved it as a crime writer because I feel like a lot of times in crime fiction, especially more detective fiction, it was a nice twist on the hyper masculinity that we often see in that genre. Right. And so, you know, tell me a little bit more about that, like female allyship in the book. Clearly that's a theme that goes through all of your books, um, but it really just was a delight in this one. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, I, I really loved, grew to love some of the characters uh, in The Burn. And there were a lot of wounded people. I mean, if you look at the constellation of characters around Betty, I mean, Bet Betty's wounded, but James Earl, there's, there's something very uh, tragic about, but lovely about James Earl. And um, all of these people that she kind of rescues, she's, she's on desk duty, and then she's put on kind of a probationary period, and she goes to the street to find out information. And she comes in contact with all of these broken, desperate people. And it was a great way to show that Betty, her empathy and her soft heartedness. I mean, she's a badass, obviously, but, if, but for me, it gets tedious for crime, for PI novels, when they're car chases and guns going off all the time. That's not interesting to me. What's interesting to me is character development. And the fact that, you know, David asked me last time, what, what could be changed? What, what would improve policing? And to me, it's very clear that more women on the force because um, I, I did, a little, uh, did a little digging when I was doing research. And as it turns out of the NYPD, that out of all of the civilian complaints that there's like 20, maybe 20% 20 of the force is women, but only 3% of civilian complaints were lodged against women. And they found that using women as hostage negotiators and sending women into, even, even if they have to partner with a man, that they find that there's less physical altercation. They find that they are a calming influence, their empathy. Uh, and so I, I wanted to show that, you know, Betty solved a lot of her problems, not through violence, but through using her wits and using, um, using 
the information of people who were on the front lines on the street. And so it was just a nice way for me to balance her, you know, her harder, her harsher side. Um, and so that to me is interesting, the character development and having really broken complex characters in there were, were interesting. Well, me. another way that she finds her way out of these tough situations, as both titles allude to, are these huge scenes that her, her dead uncle Benny guides her through, like kind of, a, he's a spirit guide. Right. And so did you, I'm interested in that as a writer, did you set out to make Uncle Benny kind of this um, supernatural guide, or was he one of those who kind of bubbled up? Um, well, again, it was, um, <clears throat> he was the counterweight mm -hmm. to, um, to the corruption in, in Betty's family because her brother and her father were corrupt cops. And I, and I addressed that at the beginning of The Burn where it talks, it explains more about why her brother committed suicide and talks about the corruption. At the end of the chapter, when she burns the obituary of, of you know, the cop that gets assassinated, she says, my father looked at me and realized that he was looking in the eyes of an honest cop. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, you know, Uncle Benny to me was her pole star. And I, I really love the glimmer, just, just like a little bit of glitter there of the supernatural. I didn't want to be heavy handed and I wanted to leave it to the reader to decide, is Benny really just, has she metabolized Uncle Benny's character? Is, is he really just uh, an integrated part of her psyche now? Or is there something really from the beyond, you know, I kind of left it, it could be either way, you know, and when she goes to see Dr. Theodosu and he's talking to her uh, about his experience as a young policeman in Cyprus. And Theo Theodosu is a real person. He wasn't a cop, but he did go through the Cypriot war. And so I got some of the stories from, from Theo, from the real Theo. And, when he's talking to Betty and he said, you know, my grandmother told me, sort of whispered in my ear and told me that there, that there was a child still alive in the basement after the house was bombed. And she said, well, how fortunate was that? And he said, yeah, but she'd been dead for years. So it's that, it's opening the door to the possibility that there are stranger things in heaven and earth type of thing that, that, um, that the, that the psyche is very complex, you know, what are internal influences, what are external influences. So I just, I love the, leaving that vague. Is Uncle Benny, Betty? Is that just her subconscious speaking through that persona? Or is Uncle Benny really out there in the ether just whispering to her? And he comes to her in times of when she's in danger and especially when she's running Mm -hmm. or when she's sleeping, she's in an altered mental state. And inspiration, I mean, you know, as a creative person, as a writer, so many times that inspiration, that where did that come from, mm -hmm. happens at a time when we're in that alpha state, when we're in an altered state, when we're walking, driving in a car, where the conscious part of the brain is doing something automatic, and then something bubbles up, and you go, Eureka, that's, that's it. So is that the muse? Is that, you know, Turk Sikori sitting on your shoulder and whispering in your ear? Or is that just, you know, an, an, an intrinsic part of your own creativity? So I've just kind of left it and kind of left it open. And I love that you took that approach. And I also love that you gave her, gave really a reader a platform through her conversations with the therapist to explore mm -hmm. that a little deeper. So right. it was a nice little treat for the reader to give voice to what we're already thinking. Um, let me pull up some of the questions from our participants. Y'all been so patient. Let's see. Um, here is one from Robin. Um, I'd, and you talked a little bit about this last time, but I know this is on the top of everyone's mind. Um, I'd like to know about switching from historical to crime. How did one inform the other? You talked a little bit about violence, you know, running through both of those, but can you give a little more to Robin? Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect to write crime. It was, it was, um, it was an unexpected change that, um, that 
I wasn't sure in the beginning that I could do. I was, I was very uncertain about making the shift because the historical fiction, that was my first love and I'd written three books and it was going well, but I had, I had written that short story um, that was published in a crime anthology called uh, uh, Coincidences Can Kill You and it featured Betty Rizek and the publisher said, you know, um, this is different. This is unique. You know, Betty is, is not your usual straight, and I mean straight in many ways, um, law enforcement officer. You know, she's really a force of nature. She's kind of, she's, um, she's different. What do you think about developing a novel? And I just, you know, I thought about it for a while and I decided to do it, but I would just jump off the cliff and do it. And I, it, I struggled with it for a while. The first 90 pages that I sent to my agent, she, after a couple of weeks, she came back to me and she goes, uh, it's, it's good. It's not great, but it's okay. Oh dear, I've made a terrible mistake because the deal was I had to present an entire book. I couldn't present an idea. I had, I mean, the deal was with the publisher. We really want you to do this, but you have to deliver to us a novel, you know, a book. Cause we don't know if you can do it either. We think you can, we'd love for you to, but uh, so I really, um, I was in a quandary. It really, it really scared me. Um, but, at, but after I talked to her and I pulled myself off the floor, I realized that she was right. She was right. And I hit the delete button and erased everything and started over from scratch. And that's where the dime came from. And, and it was a, it was a steep current, uh, learning curve, but I'm really glad I did it because I, I love Betty. I think it challenged me in ways that I might not have been challenged writing historical fiction. Um, doing research was a challenge because active duty, especially undercover cops, don't usually talk to you. So I couldn't just go into a library and pull the librarian aside and say, you know, give me all you've got on the English Civil War. It just didn't work like that. Um, so, but I, but um, it's really been so satisfying because I, I got to exercise different muscles. The, one of the themes that, that to me is consistent in, in the books that I've worked on is that they're strong female characters. And often these are women who fall outside of what's considered acceptable behavior for females. You know, I wrote about the, you know, a Salem, an accused Salem witch, a prostitute, um, as they say, as the saying goes, nice women don't make history. And so I love the idea of strong, really strong women in a man's world, making her voice be heard and, and doing it with empathy, with smarts, uh, with instinct, you know, with bravery, with guts, but, but doing it differently than the way it's been done traditionally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really interesting is finding ways. It's like a maze that you set up and you can go the direct path, the way, the way things are done, A to, a to Z, or what's more interesting to me is to build this labyrinth. You know, she's in a burning building. How is she going to get out of the burning building? How is she going to, she's been put on desk duty. How is she going to rally her forces to find out what she needs to find out? setting up those, those stumbling blocks, those roadblocks, which are real for women in law enforcement. They're really real. Taking those stumbling blocks and having her hurdle, you know, make those hurdles, climb over it, under it, around it in inventive ways um, is a challenge, but it's very satisfying when I figure it out. It's like, oh, okay, you know, I, yay Betty. So. <laughs> Oh, so another question from Elaine, kind of piggybacking on the um, historical side. She said, are there specific dates used in this book? Because this is a crime fiction book. Um, or she said, yeah, there's, there are dates that you start every chapter with. Is that specific to you in any way or special to you in any way? Um, uh, yeah, I think the dates just help to uh, cement in, in my mind the passage of time and reminds me in a physical way of pacing because, and I think I was talking to David about this last time perhaps, that in, in historical fiction, a lot of times you can meander. It's like a nice canoe ride down a stream. You hit some rapids and then, but it's a slow burn oftentimes. 
not all the time with historical fiction, but pacing is so important with contemporary crime because the expectation is you want to keep the heart rate up. You know, it, it's sort of cardio for, you know, for the readers and um, having those dates as a um, benchmark reminds me of the passing of time in the passing of real time. And what does that mean for Betty? The clock is ticking. So that's why I put the dates in there. Yeah, and I think Megan Abbott takes a similar approach. I heard a talk with her one time where she said she tries to build suspense by making everything happen as as short a period of time as possible. And the dates on there reminded me of that. Yeah, yeah, because most usually uh, with both the dime and the burn, we're only talking about a matter of weeks or months. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, a long period of time. So, and I think that helps when you telescope <clears throat> the time that the action takes place, you, you're forced to, um, you know, to keep the, that breathless pace going. Yeah. Um, and since we are, you know, these are writing programs sponsoring this, I was really curious from a writer's standpoint, I believe you said two weeks ago with David that um, you started or you wrote The Heretic's Daughter in your 40s, you know, and you oh, yeah. had, yeah, and you had a, you've clearly had a robust career since then, but I feel like there is this, like, this erroneous idea in the publishing industry that we all have to be Zadie Smith and start getting published when we're 21. Um, but there have been a lot of writers lately, like um, Della Owens with um, Where the Crawdads Seen and right. um, Valentine with Elizabeth Whitmore. And what would you say to writers of all ages you know, about this idea that publishing is for the young? <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> I think the expectation is you know, that um, to be the young, struggling, starving writer. And, and there are many examples of that. And I think you have to have a certain amount of physical fortitude mm -hmm. and drive and a certain amount of, you know, hormonal influx to, to keep that, to keep that punishing pace because, you know, you're going to be starving and working odd jobs and trying to keep body and soul together. But you have to be young to do that. So, you know, I had gone to UT to study writing and my dad talked me into getting a real job, which I did. And I lived and worked in New York for 20 years, worked in two very male dominated fields. Um, and I don't regret it, but I had no time to write. I mean, I was traveling and working a very brutal schedule. And finally, uh, just like in 1998, 99, um, I, was, I was in my, you know, past my mid forties. And I started taking a close look at my life and I started losing people who were, you know, family members, friends who were very dear to me. And my sense of mortality really caught up with me. And I said, if I get to the end of my life and don't at least try writing a book, you know, will I regret it? And the answer to that was yes. So I took an early retirement. I moved to Texas and I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to jump in with both feet. And, and of course, foolishly, I thought, ah, how hard can it be? <laughs> I, I, I work, I work hard, you know, I can, I can, you know, I can do this. Well, you know, thinking about it and actually doing it are two different things. And it took me, I didn't know anyone in publishing. I didn't have an agent. I moved to, back to Dallas, didn't know a lot of people until my son started school. And I started working The Heretic's Daughter, and it took me five years to complete it. It was a very solitary process. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in any writer's groups. It was something that I felt like I had to do for myself. Um, I showed it to a few, you know, a few family members, but, you know, it's, it's in the contract and the small print. They have to like your stuff. So mm -hmm. I, didn't, I thought I had a good story because it was based on, true, you know, my true family history. I thought it was a good story, but I didn't know. And I started sending it out when it, when I thought it was done and, you know, to agents and I got a lot of rejections until I, and I just kept plugging away until I got my agent. And that's when I got the publishing deal. But I would say, you know, I think if you're older, you have a deeper reservoir emotionally and experientially on which to draw, you know, you've been a mother, a brother, a father, a son, you know, you, you've a grandparent and you've collected all of these memories that you can feed into your writing. And I think, I think there's something really lovely and elegant about a person as they mature 
and they decide, he or she decides, I have a book in me and I'm, I'm going to write that book. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a certain amount of courage um, and tenacity to do it. And of course, no, th there's a lot of uncertainty because you don't know. You know, all you can do is write it and then send it out into the world. Um, but I think, I, I think that writing, it's not like you're going to take up downhill skiing at 50, right? <laughs> as long as you can hold a thought in your head and hold a pencil or sit at a keyboard, you can write. And, and I think it's, you know, a lot of times we spend our lives, our early years, raising our children, working to put food on the table. Writing takes a tremendous amount of energy and time and intent to not just for the writing, but for the research part of it as well. And sometimes we don't get to do that until we're older because we don't have a patron. We, you know, we have to work to support our families. Um, and I think it's, I think that it is perfectly okay. And I think it's a noble pursuit to wait until you have the time and the inclination to do it. And by God, you write your book. <laughs> and I, you know, I encourage it. Yeah. Well, and I'm curious about your process now, um, because one thing that you are known for is being incredibly supportive to other writers. I mean, you blurbed my book, Very Kind, and you're always retweeting and lifting up others in the writing community. Um, so, you know, what, what part does community play now for you in the writing process now that, you know, you are, an, you're not a nobody anymore, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're firmly in the community. Um, Community is incredibly important. It's, it's incredibly important. And when, no matter what age you are, when you're first starting to write, it's, it's, very, it's a very emotional time. It, it's a very, um, uh, it's very scary, you know? And um, the marketplace is tough. The marketplace, getting an agent, keeping an agent, getting a publisher, keeping a publisher, it's, it's, it can be really brutal. And so where you can turn apart from your family uh, are other writers who will have a generosity of spirit. I, I was very lucky that I had a couple of writers that encouraged me, you know, blurbed my book, talked about my book, and I, I'm, I'm paying it forward because um, I have a, a, a feeling of kinship to people who, who make the decision, who make the courage to pursue an artistic endeavor. Mm -hmm. And um, the world is a tough place, especially now we're so isolated and Dallas has got a wonderful, um, just a wonderful community of writers, some very talented writers and, 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 the, and the number of writers is growing. And so um, I think it's a win-win situation you know, um, paying it forward, that, that good, you know, that good karma, I think, comes, <laughs> comes around. I saw a quote on Twitter recently that um, writing a novel is like telling a joke for five years and not knowing whether it's funny, you know, and I feel like part of a community is, you, at least you have people to be like, is it kind of funny, you know, so. <laughs> you know, that is so apt, because you know, working on a manuscript, and most people work years on a book. I mean, yes, there are those fortunate few who can sit down and in a couple of months, you know, they have a novel. But I like that's, them. Me, that's not most of us. Most of us have to spend years working on it. And, and that's so apt because there are times when you read it and you'll go, yeah, this is, this is not bad. This is pretty good. And then there are times where you read it and you'll say, this is crap. What am I doing? What am I doing? And um, it, you just, you know, you just don't know. You're not going to hear the applause until after it's already in the can, right? And that's, and there's a, and you're finished with the book and it can take a very long time to publication too. So you're, you're, kind of, it's a waiting game. And the only, I mean, the best cure for that while you're waiting is to get onto the next project. Oh, well, yeah. it brings us to the next question from yeah. Kimberly. Um, so what is Betty up to in the next book? Does she continue to aggravate Jackie or is she able to appease <laughs> her partner by taming some of her wild and self-destructive ways? I hope she doesn't become too good. 
Oh no, not Betty. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, Betty's yeah. There's 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 too much prickly pear in in Betty to uh, for that to go away. Well, okay. So the tentative title, and I'm about more than two thirds of the way finished with the third book. The tentative title, and they may not let me keep this, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. It's called Evangeline. Oh. And Evangeline Roy that makes that makes appearances, um, kind of ephemeral appearances in the second book comes roaring back to life in the third book. And as with the first two books, I start off, I start off every book going back in time. And um, the first chapter uh, takes place, the action takes place the night before 9-11. And um, the theme, the overarching theme, we, we've learned a lot about the men in Betty's life, and I've only referenced her mother a couple of times. Um, and now that Betty is, um, so she's taken in Mary Grace, this pregnant teenager, and I will tell you that Mary Grace has her baby. And so Betty gets to, in this third book, gets to, gets to, um, investigate all the aspects of what it means to be a mother, what, to be a caretaker, mm -hmm. to be, is, is motherhood the essence of womanhood or does that lie outside of what a woman is? What, what is this? Betty has natural protective qualities where she, where she takes in orphans off the street, but she doesn't really want, to, she has a lot of questions because of her difficult relationship with her own mother. She, she's not sure that she wants this at all. Jackie does, but she's not sure that she wants to do this. Um, so I start off with a quote, at the beginning of the book that says, how does it feel with my teeth in your heart? And that's a quote from Euripides, Medea. And it's the, all the aspects of mother as a nurturing being and mother as Callie the destroyer. Because Evangeline was a mother, but she's, she's monstrous. Um, and Betty's responsible for her two sons, her two beloved sons dying, being killed. And so Evangeline's back to wreak as much havoc and revenge as she possibly can. So that's, that's kind of the overarching theme. So Betty is, she's been made a sergeant, so she's elevated, she's a little more stable, but things start to unravel for her again as Evangeline starts very strategically unraveling her life. So that's kind of the, the, over, the overarching story. Well, I love that as a follow-up in, in terms of character to the burn, because in the burn, she is learning to be nurtured and accept help. And now she's having right. to put that outward in a, in a motherly way. Right. Um, and another question from the audience from Joe. Hey, Joe, I know you. Um, so <laughs> what aspects of life in Texas fuel your writing, especially now during this pandemic? Is mm -hmm. it setting history? Have you found a change in your writing from January to now? Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the story is set back, so Evangeline is set back in 2014, pre-pandemic, but it makes me think when I'm working on it, how extraordinarily uh, the world has changed within a few months. And, and it's like 9-11, they'll be before the pandemic and after the pandemic. In terms of my writing style, it, 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 it actually, because I'm home all the time now, I mean, I'm home most of the time anyway, but now that I kind of have to be at home, I, it's on the one hand, you would think it would be better for writing because it's like, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna sit at my computer and write but I've been really fighting being distracted. You know, I, like a lot of people are sad. I'm angry. I'm worried about people. I have lost some friends in New York, lost as in died. Um, and I, I find myself being pulled away to the drama that's unfolding on the day to day. So just for me, my challenge is to shut that off. And I, you know, I look at the news, I look at the, 
It's like, what horror awaits us today? Look at the news and then go on my walk and then try to, as much as I can, to shut that all out so that it doesn't interfere with, with the writing process. In terms of my, you know, my research, um, you know, I can get in my car and I'm still, you know, it's still in Dallas and I still use a lot of landmarks that are, you know, well known. Um, so I can get in my car and I can drive around and I can search things out and I can get on the phone and I can call my cousin or I can call other people. So my world isn't that different in terms of the writing process, except this being distracted by everything that's going on. So trying to stay focused is, is it's hard. It's really hard. Well, um, Joe's question was a little bit similar to the one that I totally hijacked from Scott Montgomery's Book People blog, because oh. we all know Scott Montgomery. He's yeah. a um, but he did a blog recently where he asked a bunch of writers, including Joe Lansdale, what their main characters, you know, their most famous characters were doing during quarantine. And I thought that was a fun oh. one. So um, let's assume that, like, what are Jackie and Betty doing during quarantine? We know they're frontline workers. We know that they're... Right. Well, Jackie's a doctor, so they're both going in. Yeah, and, but um, Closed and they have to stay home for 14 days. What are they doing? Oh, poor Jackie. <laughs> now, as long as Betty could go out and run her seven miles a day, that that would help. But um, I, you know, that would that would be hard if they were if they were quarantined. Uh, I love Betty, but I wouldn't want to be her roommate. Mm -hmm. She's a very large personality. I know that when she did go out in public, she'd be wearing a mask and she'd kick anybody's ass that wasn't, including another policeman. So I mean, she, you know, she would be mask all the way, and she'd probably have something really really tough, you know, like a leather with studs on it or something, you know, just to, just to you frighten. You can make those. <laughs> But um, yeah, I, um, and, and somebody, and I, we talked about this two weeks ago, David, we were talking about this, that, you know, I talked to my cousin about, you know, the, the police, you know, the defunding of the police. And he was, he was glad to see it happen. Um, he said that, you know, too many policemen get uh, military grade weapons that they are not properly trained for, and all it can do is escalate a problem. They're there to protect and serve, not, you know, not draw a new DMZ line. But that's, that's the way a lot of, you know, it's psychologically, if you give somebody a rocket launcher, it changes them psychologically. You know, if you just, if you, if you don't give them any high powered weaponry, then they have to use other strategies to deal with conflict and um you know he thinks that you know more he's all for more women on the force he's all for and really defunding is kind of a misnomer because it sounds like we're taking all the money away from the cops and then they're going to be you know stranded out there on their own what it is it's a re it's a reappropriation of funds to community services because a lot of people are arrested because they're homeless a lot of people are arrested because they're mentally ill and they don't have the medical resources or the community outreach to help them. So the cops are doing cleanup duty. And if you get it, you know, someone who's off their meds because they don't have insurance, they get obstreperous. And then you have a situation where somebody dies because they're uncontrollable. And so it, it's not really defunding. What it is is, is redistributing funds into the community so that the cops can do, so that the cops can follow the spirit of the law as well as the letter of the law. Does the cop need to be, to be arresting everybody, you know, just because they can? No. If they're not doing any harm, focus on the, the real bad people who are doing really bad things and leave the rest of the, you know, the poor slobs alone. Um, that's just, but that's just my opinion. But I was really, I was, I mean, I know my cousin really well and I, and I was really very heartened to hear him say, yes, we need retraining and we need redistributing of funds. Hmm. All right. Well, yeah, I was thinking about Jackie too during um, quarantine. Just like, yeah, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be trapped there, nor would I want to be, um, you know, Betty's therapist, as much as I love her, you know, I think it'd be a tough gig. <laughs> yeah, well, she gave Theo a hard time, didn't she? She did, she did. I thought I was really proud of Theo. I was like, yeah, I, I can respect his approach to this. So, well then. <laughs> 
Blake, did you? Yes. Well, it is eight o'clock. We uh, okay. we're kind of at the end of our time. I do. We did just get another question from Allison Patrick. Uh, Kathleen, she wants to know what genres do you read for pleasure? Uh, well, I, I do read fiction. I do read a lot of crime fiction because I, I like to know what my what my friends are you know what my friends are up to in the in the crime world. Um, I read. Let's see. But I've been reading a lot of nonfiction. Also, I read uh, the uh, the Splendid and the Vile, the the book by Eric Larson about Churchill. I read. Uh, I'm reading the Chernow's Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, because I finally saw Hamilton on the Disney Channel. Uh, finally, I was one of the last people on the planet probably that hadn't seen it. I saw it, oh, okay. But I'm reading Chernow's biography of Hamilton, which is really fascinating. I did read Isabel Allende's book, A Long Petal of the Sea, with the title comes from the Pablo Neruda poem, and it's about uh, Spaniards who go to Chile following the Spanish, you know, Franco's war. And that was, that was excellent. Um, and I read, I, I love Peter Heller. I read um, The River, I think it's called. Um, but I, I, I have been reading a lot of, of nonfiction uh, lately, so. I, I did start, let me just say, I did start, I did start reading um, Colson Whitehead's book, Zone One. Mm -hmm. So Colson Whitehead, I think has won two Pulitzers. Mm -hmm. He wrote The Underground Railroad. And I mean, he's an amazing, amazing, amazing writer. But zone one is about the zombie apocalypse, and it was too much. I could, it was too. It was too much. Like the build up to it was too much. Like what's going on now? And I thought, no, I can't. I, I gotta. No, I gotta set this down. <laughs> well, um, are there any other audience questions that you want to ask before we wrap it up? And we mention our uh, our winners of, of free seminars from Writing Workshops Dallas or Gemini Inc. Uh, does anybody else uh, want to ask a question before we wrap it up? All right. Well, um, I am. I want to thank Heather and Kathleen. Heather, thank you so much for your great questions. Um, and Kathleen, thank you for letting us read the uh, the dime and the burn along with you over the last month. Um, and uh, David, thank you again for moderating uh, with the dime. It's been a lot of fun. I've looked forward to it. Um, I've put some links here. You can buy Heather's "Ain't Nobody Nobody" from Interabang Books online. Um, you can buy all of Kathleen's books uh, through Interabang uh, online through that link right there as well. So make sure you pick them up. Um, and then lastly, just the winners of our free seminar, I'll email you, but uh, for submitting a question, you can go to Writing Workshops Dallas website or Gemini Inc.'s website, and you can select a, a seminar if you see something there that you'd like to take. Uh, Marion and Kimberly Morrison. So I will be uh, reaching out to you uh, via email. So Yay. there you go. Thank you for submitting questions. Thank you all for being here. I do look forward to this. We have more Big Texas Read coming up um, with Emmy Perez. Uh, Emmy she's gonna Perez. Emmy Perez. Yeah. She's great. She's a poet. Um, she's the current 2020 um, Poet Laureate of Texas. So we've read some fiction and we're going to switch it up and we'll be reading uh some of um her poetry so we look forward to seeing you all there thank you kathleen thank you heather and thank you all for being uh literature lovers so thank you thanks all. everyone thanks thank you, thanks kathleen <laughs> thank you heather thanks david thank you blake good night, good night yeah. everyone good night good night you guys thanks Thank you, Heather. That was great. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, no problem. I'm sorry I didn't get to every single question, but I tried to make sure that the questions were touched on at least. Oh, like, Heather, you were amazing. Oh. Yeah, so good. Thank you. Those questions were so good. Like, it was, it was great. So, you were thank perfect. you. You were perfect. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you thank time. you. Oh, thank you. Come you made it so time. back to follow. Every time. Come back. We want you to come back. <laughs> Oh, I love doing this. I could talk about this all day. Um, maybe you want to, or Blake, did you say you wanted to do Joe Lansdale? Do one of you want to do? Um, I don't know if Kathleen's going to do that. Um, are you going to do Joe or? Um, I'm not going to do Joe. Yeah. And then I Heather, thought Kathleen might do it, but I wasn't sure. So. Yeah. Yeah, and we should also have you on the big Texas read, Heather. Uh, yeah. so if, you wanted, if you want us to, to talk about your book and have you on, 
you know, if you want to do that, we're putting the schedule together still. So oh, I would um, love it. I would love it. Yeah. If you wanna if you want one of your friends to or if you want a writer to moderate instead of me or <laughs> Yeah. I like I like having, you know, because like Kathleen blurbed your book and you guys just kind of had a great rapport. So um that was awesome. Okay. Well thank um, y'all. This was a really nice opportunity. I appreciate it. And I'm glad we finally got to meet David and Blake. Hopefully we'll get to see each other in person. I'm gonna read your book. I'm gonna read <laughs> yeah. your book. Well, yeah. if, you're in the, if you're in the sticks, it'll be a good one. It'll be a good one. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, uh.